whatever you want that you can play it and enjoy it. Uh, <clears throat> today we have uh, again Cindy Perry returning to us, uh, who's a uh, longtime student and teacher of Unity. Uh, was involved back uh, in Renaissance many years ago, uh, and as a little girl, she once told her mother that she wanted to be involved in ministry and maybe be a priest because that was in the Catholic Church. Of course, her mother said, yeah, "Well, they don't have women here <laughs> as priests," but she knew then that she wanted to be working with people and being able to send out the message uh, that we all need at all times. So uh, with that being said, let's give her a nice Unity East welcome again, Cindy Perry. Bless you. Thank you. I'm so delighted to be back. Um, I was trying to remember when I was here last. I know it wasn't that long ago, but I know it was at least five weeks ago because four weeks ago today, I was in the hospital uh, day after surgery. I may have mentioned that to you when I was here last. I was having a hip replacement. So um, if you see me a little bit wobbly, um, I'm still getting adjusted to this new apparatus. I'm only four weeks out of surgery. I'm very pleased to be walking without a walker or a cane. Um, uh, you know, the title of my talk, Step by Step, I, I thought, yep, that's what I'm doing. It's like I'm learning to walk and move all over again. So, but, I, you know, we, we do that all the time in our lives. You know, if, if, if we become aware, we're, we're always learning something new. And, and if, you, if you don't think you are, I, I invite you to reflect on that. What have I learned today? Or how am I growing? How have I grown in the past week, month, year? Because it's so easy when we get set in our ways and in our patterns of being to think that we're not evolving and growing. And that's just not true. Because the world is ever-changing, and we're a part of that world, and that means we are ever-changing. So we don't have to be doing anything monumental, but step by step, in the awareness, um, we are changing, evolving, always growing, and becoming better. So the subtitle of my talk is really what the bulk of it is about, um, back to basics. Uh, and oftentimes that's where we need to go to get a fresh start, right? We need to unlearn or unthink the things that we've been thinking that created what we're living right now and create anew uh, by getting back to basics. So I'm excited to share this with you today. Um, and it's all about unity, the basic unity principles. Now, most of us probably were not raised in the unity movement. In fact, people who were are, are an anomaly. I mean, there are not a lot of people who were raised up in unity. Um, most of us found unity at some point in our lives, maybe very recently, uh, maybe some time ago. But I'm sure that we all will remember our first experience of unity. Every person I've ever talked to about it describes it in a very similar way. Um, I've heard people say, I felt like I was home. Or I finally felt understood. Or there was a peacefulness, a calm. Or there was a special energy. But everyone I've ever talked to, regardless of how they were raised, with or without religion or whatever their path had been up until then, found something different. And most of them felt a sense of, of freedom. So um, I was at a Unity Church recently and somebody told me that they'd been coming to the church for about three years, and they loved it there. They never experienced anything like that, but they didn't really understand it. They, they, they didn't know what unity was really all about and found it very difficult to explain. And that prompted the idea behind this. We could all use a little reminder. Because it can be kind of difficult to explain. Now, I was raised Catholic, Catholic school for 12 years, sent my children to Catholic schools, very involved in my Catholic upbringing. I wanted to have a close relationship with God. Greg's right. I was seven years old when I told my mother I wanted to be a priest. So I couldn't do that. And 
I didn't like the idea of being a nun at all. And, but but um, so I, I, I pursued my faith in different ways, but always within the Catholic faith. Now, I have nothing against the Catholic faith, and it upsets me a little bit, I will tell you, when I hear people say I'm a recovering Catholic, because in my opinion, there's nothing to recover from. That was your foundation. If that was your foundation, then let it be that, okay? So when you think of a building or, or a, a home, the foundation is the most important part, but it's not always the most beautiful or it's seldom the most beautiful. Sometimes they even hide it underground, right? <laughs> and build this structure on top of it, but without the foundation. So I invite you, whatever your background was before coming to Unity, to be grateful for it, because it brought you to the place where you were open to find Unity. So when I left the Catholic Church, when I discovered Unity, my parents were not happy at all. Now, mind you, I was in my middle 40s. <laughs> I had not lived with my parents in about 25 years, and they were no longer responsible for um, raising me up and teaching me. <laughs> uh, but they were hurt by that, and they didn't understand. And as much as I tried to explain, I felt like I was digging my hole deeper and deeper. And even when I clearly understood the unity principles, they didn't want to hear about them. And I had to get to a place where I was okay with that. Because it wasn't what I called myself or how I identified myself that mattered. It was my relationship with God. And over the years, my parents commented on how they could tell that I was walking a different path. Um, they could see the growth in my faith life. And um, two weeks ago, for the very first time, um, my mother was with me when I led a service at another Unity Church. And she was sitting there very proudly and rather amazed. And then we went home and she said, she's gonna get ready to go to the evening service at the Catholic Church. <laughs> and that's okay, and that's okay. So, uh, but, but you know, it is different. And so I wanna take some time to review it with you today. There are five basic unity principles. Um, and if we know what they are and we, and we live into them, then we deepen our faith. And that's what it's all about. It's about your relationship with the God of your understanding. So principle number one states, God is the source and creator of all. There is no other enduring power. God is good and present everywhere. Well, this differs a little bit from my upbringing because if God is the only power and there is no other enduring power, then what is this Satan we talk about? And I had a difficulty with that. And I said, well, man, you know, if, if God really is everywhere present and all good and the only power, why does evil exist in the world and that whole thing that we're always questioning, right? But after a little while, I said, you know what? I always believed that. I really did, inside of me, always believe that. But I was taught something different, and so there was that conflict. So how can we say there is no opposing power to God? Deepak Chopra says it like this. God is the evolutionary impulse of the universe. God is infinite creativity, infinite love, infinite compassion, infinite caring. God is infinite, never ending, always present, all good. Ayanla Van Zant says this, love is the greatest, most enduring power in the universe. Then again, she says, there is no other power. 
Well, even when I was growing up, I learned that love is another name for God, and the two words can be used interchangeably. So Ayanla is speaking this truth of this unity message. There is only love. A first grade teacher at the beginning of the school year, trying an effort to get to know her students better, asked them all to draw a picture of something they really love. And she was walking around the classrooms looking at their creations and delighted by the things she was seeing, the people and the places and the things. And she came upon this one little boy who was just kind of coloring in, in many different colors on his page. And she said, what is that that you're drawing? And he said, it's God. And she says, well, how can you draw a picture of God? Nobody knows what God looks like. And he said, they will when I finish my picture. <laughs> So this idea of God and this presence, this love, this good that always is unique to each one of us. Nobody can tell us what it's supposed to be or what it's supposed to feel like or how we're supposed to connect with it. But when we do, we know. And when we make a conscious connection with the God of our being, there is no doubt. Principle number one says, simply, God is. God is. Principle number two. We are spiritual beings created in God's image. The Spirit of God lives within each person. Therefore, all people are inherently good. Did you hear that? All people? All people. All people are inherently good. Now, although I know what inherently means, it's not a word that I hear used very often. I thought it might be a good idea to define it. So I looked it up and found this. Inherently existing in someone or something as a permanent and inseparable element, quality, or attitude. That's good news. That's really good news. The presence of God within us is permanent. We are inseparable from that. The unity principle says God in us is a permanent fixture that no matter what we do, we cannot separate ourselves from. That's good news. Because I don't know about you, but in my lifetime, I've done some things that might have separated me, you know? I might have felt separated. That's okay. We're human. Just the way God wanted us to be. Before Jesus went to the cross, he was having a discussion with the disciples, who were his friends. I mean, they were bonded. They were a unit. He had traveled with them and taught them and and, and shared meals with them. They spent a lot of time together. And what he said in, in, in John chapter 14, verse 20 is, on that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. You see, he said that to remind them because they were afraid. What do you mean you're going to leave us? and we won't be able to see you. We want to go with you. And he says, no, no, where I'm going, you can't come. But don't worry. God's in me. I'm in you. We're this unit that can never be separated, even when I go away and you can't see me anymore. And I think that's been an age-old struggle. We can't see God. The first grade boy could, <laughs> obviously. Uh, we can't see 
we can't touch. But if we remember God presence that's in every one of us, then we see God. We see God whenever we see one another. Now I know that sometimes we meet people or hear about people who do not seem to be inherently good, who do not seem to be connected to God or, or any, any good at all. And here's where it's important for us as believers to remember. The truth is, they are inherently good. God does live in this person. So their attitude or their words or their actions aren't displaying that right now. But I know it's there. And so instead of pushing that person away from us uh, because they have a different idea than us or because they walk a different path than we do or look different than, than we do, to remember the Christ presence within them allows us to unite the way Jesus taught us. God in me, I in God, we're all one. So there's this ancient Sanskrit greeting that speaks to this. And um, typically, it's done with hands held together, either at the heart chakra or sometimes at the third eye chakra, and bow. And we say, I bow to the Christ in you. So regardless of what we're looking at or who we're looking at, we're saying, I'm going to make it a point to recognize and remember Christ lives in you, even if you're not showing it, even if you're not aware of it. You might know that greeting as namaste. So when we come together in a group like this, in a gathering of like-minded people, it's rather easy to look at one another and say, namaste, I see you. I behold the Christ in you. It's a little bit tougher to do out in the world. And the more we practice it, just like anything else, the more we practice, the better we get. So let's do a little practice right now. Turn to someone sitting near you. Take a good look at them. Acknowledge the Christ that is there within them. I see you. I know who you are. And I say to you, namaste, namaste. Principle two, I am. Principle three, we create our life experiences through our way of thinking. Say that again. I create my life experiences by what I am thinking. So this differs greatly from what I was taught in my early years, too, in this. God was the creator of all things. And if I prayed for the things I wanted, I'd, I'd, you know, maybe I'd get them if I was good enough and all of that kind of thing. And what I realized, and, um, and when you step into this place that empowers you, as a co-creator with God, it's liberating and scary at the same time. <laughs> you mean I'm responsible? Okay. So this is not a new idea. Many, many hundreds and perhaps thousands of books have been written on the, on the topic. We get what we think about. Thoughts are things. Um, one of the earliest books, perhaps the first, was by Prentice Mulford, and he was one of the founders of the New Thought Movement, and he wrote a book uh, back in 1889. It's a little while ago. Thoughts are things. And we've all heard it. And we've all heard these things before. Talk about them all the time in unity, but even outside of unity. People are talking about being positive and having a positive attitude and how that brings things about. But it's deeper than that. 
because what we think about, we bring about. And some people want to deny that and say, you know, I think about this and I pray for that and, and, and it never happens to me. Is that the only thought you're thinking? What are you thinking about? If I, think, um, if I think when I'm homebound and walking with a walker and on pain medications, if I think, thank you God for healing me and I want to be well and this is the greatest thing because once I recover from this, I'm going to be able to get back to better than ever. But then when the pain gets bad, I say, this is the most terrible, horrible, awful thing that's ever happened to me. Then I have conflict of thought. Okay, so what thought am I putting out and, and that, that God is responding to? God doesn't pick or choose what thoughts he responds to. God responds to whatever I think. It's not easy. It's not easy because we live in a world where we're distracted all the time. We live in a world where we're told what to think. And we're spoon-fed things that, that show us a troubled world. And sometimes we get consumed with thinking about things that make us sad or upset or angry. Dr. Wayne Dyer said, just keep reminding yourself, I get what I think about, whether I want it or not. Whether I want it or not. I, and, and I'm Martin Luther King Jr. Um, so many, so many great thoughts and, and quotes from that man. He said, you, can't, you cannot keep birds from flying over your head but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair. <laughs> so if we're talking about birds like thoughts, right? Things are going to come into your mind without your invitation. You see something on TV, somebody says something to you, you witness an accident, whatever. Thoughts are swirling around all the time. We cannot control every thought, but what we can control is how we react to it and how long we allow ourselves to give attention to it. So when we think a thought that has us feeling anything other than energized and happy and positive and, and powerful and connected with the God of our being, then we want to replace it with another thought as soon as possible and think on that thought. Perhaps the best way to, to describe this um, is in a letter uh, from Paul to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. And Paul says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, Whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing what you've learned and received and heard and seen in me, then the God of peace will be with you. I told him exactly what to think about, right? Think about all the good and then you will know the peace. It is our thoughts that create. Principle number three states we are co-creators. We are co-creators. Principle number four, there is a power in affirmative prayer which we believe increases our connection to God. So prayer is that creative thinking. Myrtle Fillmore, the co-founder of the Unity Movement, believed in this very strongly and made affirmative prayer a big part 
of what unity stood for and taught. You see, Myrtle was very sickly from her childhood. She was told she was weak and that there was no cure for what she had. She had tuberculosis. And one time she went to a lecture and she heard about this idea of affirmative prayer, affirmations. And she adopted this as her affirmation and repeated it again and again. She said, I am a child of God, therefore I do not inherit sickness. I want you to note something here in this affirmation. In the affirmation, there is also a denial. What Myrtle denies is the power of the sickness. She says, therefore, I do not inherit sickness. In other words, what she's saying, although my body is frail, although the doctors say there's no cure for what I have, I am denying this sickness. A lot of people have a problem with that because they want to say, well, it's real. I'm suffering. Can't you see? But God invites us to go beyond what we see and what we're currently experiencing today and asks us to affirm that which it is we desire. When I came to Unity and, and I learned about affirmations, I'm like, ooh, I like this. I really like this because I don't feel like I'm begging and pleading. A lot of my prayers prior to that have been prayers begging for mercy, forgive me from my sins and all those kinds of things, and, and, and not affirming the truth of what I want. So not asking powerfully, expecting to receive. Now, we can't help but have disempowering thoughts. They are going to come, and that's where the denials come in. What you want to deny is that whatever you're seeing, thinking, experiencing, doesn't have power over you. Back to principle one. How can that be? There's only one power. It's God, and God is good. And if God is good, and principle two tells me that I'm created in the image and likeness of God, and God is in me, and principle three tells me that what I think about, I have the power to bring about because I'm a co-creator with God, then why wouldn't I be able to deny what I'm currently experiencing or thinking as the truth and connect with the truth that God is answering whatever it is I affirm. One of the best ways that I found to use affirmations and denials is through meditation. There are many times when I go into meditation with something heavy on me. I'm thinking about something, I'm dwelling on something, I'm looking for an answer to something. And all I simply say is, right now, I'm feeling out of alignment, or I'm feeling a little bit distressed about something that I don't have an answer to. But what I know is that what, I, what is going on with me right now is not the power. It doesn't have any power of me. And the ultimate power is, comes when I connect with God. And so I go into a place of meditation and say, I'm open. Show me. When I led meditation a little while ago, I don't know if you felt it, but I felt the energy shift in here. A very powerful energy shift. It's that easy. And so I stood before you and I affirmed for you that the shift had taken place. 
that whatever you were thinking or feeling or anything that was weighing heavy on you prior to that had now been lifted. And sometimes it takes that, somebody else to affirm it for you. But when you connect with that and take that affirmation on, in, on your own, then you're moving in the direction of that, that oneness. Jeffrey Holland, former Brigham Young University professor, said, God is eagerly waiting for the chance to answer your prayers and fulfill your dreams, just as God always has. But God can't if you don't pray. And he can't if you don't dream. In short, he can't if you don't believe. a very powerful Christian message that he delivered. But what it points to for me is, you know, God said we co-create with him, right? In unity, we believe ourselves as co-creators. We want God to answer prayers, and God is waiting to hear them. We've got to believe in what we're asking for. And, and we have the tools. We can connect with the Christ within us, whether it's through meditation or taking classes or connecting with another person. Principle number four, I can. Principle number five, knowledge of these spiritual principles is not enough. We must live them. Oh. Oh. Oh, you mean I got to do something? <laughs> Not just think about it and feel good? <laughs> yeah, I actually do something? Yeah, I do something. You know what? The world is hurting. The world is hurting in a lot of different ways. Some of us are hurting. And you know, sometimes we need to be shaken up a little bit before we're ready to step up before we're ready to step into our power, before we're ready to think a new thought, believe a new belief. You know, it wasn't that long ago when all the turmoil was taking place in Dallas. You know, what happened there, though, wasn't what we saw in the media. That was just the surface stuff. That was the, that was the fear thing coming in, in our face over and over. The scary but what really happened in Dallas was that the residents of Dallas moved into action. They wanted their city back. So in the wake of the police shootings, believe it or not, since the shootings, the police department has received more applications to the police department than ever in their history. In the first two weeks following the police shootings, they got 39 applications compared to 11 in the entire month preceding that. People will step up if you notice what's going on around you and deny the power it has, recognize the power that you have to make a change. So there was a CNN story, um, I don't think it made it to primetime news in the aftermath of the Dallas shootings too. There was a Black Lives protest going on on this side of the street, and very peacefully, of course, the police were present to make sure it stayed that way. And on this side of the street, another rally started. All lives matter. Police were walking down the street between these two groups, and then for no apparent reason, one member from each group came and they met in the middle of the street, and they talked for a minute, and then they hugged each other, and the one group came over to the other side of the street, and they all began their march together. When a young man from the group was interviewed, he said, this is how we'll knock down walls. You see, it wasn't the words that were being said that the other group opposed. They were saying different words, but they both 
they all have the same idea. When we recognize that, if we listen beyond the words, if we look beyond what we're seeing with our physical eyes. The demonstration that day ended in prayer and with a very big group hug. <laughs> it's a beautiful story. So principle number five, I will. In James chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister has nothing to wear and has no food for the day, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, and eat well, but you do not give them the necessities of the body, what good is it? So also, faith of itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. Our principle number five, I will. Steve Jobs said, the people who are crazy enough to think that they can change the world are the ones that do. So reviewing our principles, we call them the basic unity principles. And you heard me read them, they're basic, they're short, there's no big long anything that's difficult to understand. If you'll allow me to, I'd like to make them a little bit more basic. The five unity principles, God is, I am, we co-create, I can, and I will. We can change our lives and our world. Let's get crazy enough to do so by putting our beliefs into action. Love is the answer. Let's go out and live it now. If you pray with me. God, so simple and yet so difficult. Is life really that simple? Can we really connect with you on that level of knowing that you're always present in us, as us, around us, calling us forth to be who you created us to be, wonderful lights of love to this world? God, you've given us the tools. We know that it's possible. Give us the strength and the courage to go out into this day and live into this beautiful message of peace and love. We thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Thank you. That was a wonderful message, obviously. Unity principles, you can't do better than that. Um, and it's amazing, too, uh, when you're talking about number three,